Hello and welcome to this section on logistic regression. This will be our first look at a classification algorithm or a machine learning algorithm that is used to solve classification problems. And, you know, first example for classification models is always logistic regression. You know, it's generally taught right after linear regression, linear regression being the traditional example for the simplest regression algorithm or the reg uh, regression model. So logistic regression generally follows and after logistic regression, all the subsequent algorithms are or models are generally either, you know, for regression or classification or can be used for both. But they're often just more complicated and they work in different ways and it might not be as common. But linear regression and logistic regression should always, you know, every data scientist, every machine learning expert should at least know these two models. Now, don't get confused with the name, uh, just because, you know, there's regression in the name, don't assume this to be a model used for solving regression problems, right? Where it's going to be a classification model, and the problems we're going to be solving using logistic regression are classification problems. Now, when you go into the details and the technical definitions and, you know, what's going on in the background mathematically and statistics wise, you know, I'm sure there's a very good explanation for why this is called regression. But, you know, for our sake, don't get confused. Logistic regression is for classification, whereas linear regression is for regression. So let's go ahead and define classification. We define this in the introduction to machine learning section. But since we're finally getting our hands dirty with some actual classification, let's define it again. So classification is where you predict a class from a given instance based on a set of features. So, you know, an example would be being able to predict whether an email is spam or not, right? It's either spam or it's not. There's no continuous variable. You know, it's just a binary zero or one, true or false, spam or not. So that's a very classical example of a classification problem. Another would be, you know, a more complex classification problem where you have a larger set of, of possibilities or a larger set of classes would be, you know, predicting whether a handwritten digit corresponds to zero, one, two, three, or four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, right? So you have a total of 10 classes, you know, for sure that you have a collection of handwritten digits and, you know, there's no chance of it being a letter or something else. There are only 10 possibilities corresponding to the 10 numbers. So this is also a classification problem, but it's more complex. It's a multi-class problem. You're trying to predict more than one class, but it's still classification. It's not a continuous variable that you're trying to predict, and therefore it can't be a regression model that's going to be used to solve the problem. Now, primarily, you know, we're concerned with binary classification, which is you know, this example here, where you classify an instance into one of two possible classes. So, you know, for example, either it's email or either it's spam or not spam, right? So generally, binary classification will help you solve most classification problems. And once you understand binary classification, it's not really that hard to scale it up into multi-class classification, though it is not often directly applicable but there are ways in which you can actually use binary classification approaches to solve multi-classification problems so i'm not going to go into that because that's a more advanced topic but i might make mention of it towards the end of this video but essentially if you assume that essentially you can build 10 different classifiers and each one would predict whether the digit is a number or not so the first classifier would predict whether the handwritten digit is a zero or not. So not would mean it could be any one of the other numbers. And then you'd build another classifier, which would predict if the handwritten digit is a one or not, and so on and so forth. So you can convert binary classification approaches into multi-class classification solutions. So, but that's, you know, a more advanced topic. And I'm just mentioning that to kind of convey to you the fact that, you know, if you, as long as you master binary classification, you shouldn't have that much trouble when you do encounter a multi-classification problem, you know, 
it wouldn't be too difficult for you to figure out what you, what you have to do or at least to read the relevant literature and try to understand from there. So like I just mentioned, multi-class classification, you classify an instance into one or more than two possible classes. So in the example that we gave with the digits, that would be a multi-class classification problem. There are also multi-label classification models, you know, they're called binary labels, and also multi-output or multi-class labels. But those are more advanced topics. Again, a majority of the time, just a simple understanding of binary classification suffices. And if not, multi-class classification. But these are there for reference if you want to look them up and learn about them as well. So one of the most important and most fundamental metrics or you know performance measures, if you will, for classification problems is accuracy. Now, there are a lot of performance measurements that we're going to be learning about and they're all important for you to be able to correctly interpret the results of your classification model and so it's important that you pay attention to what the exact definitions of these are you know when we're speaking english and we when you know we say that something's accurate you know we have an understanding of what accurate means but technically you know when you're talking about it in terms of classification accuracy might not always reflect on how on whether or not the model is actually good or not okay so you know you might have a high accuracy but the model with that accuracy that you, you know you have might not be the best model or or not even a good model for your problem so accuracy is just one measurement and there are other measurements that you know in english we might also refer to as accurate but technically you know they measure other performance aspects of a model so Keep that in mind and that's going to make more sense as we learn about the other performance measures as well but let's start with accuracy so accuracy basically measures the number of correct predictions over the total number of predictions so you know let's say you have 100 predictions and how many of those predictions are correct okay that is accuracy technically speaking that is the definition of accuracy as far as we're concerned. So it's a metric commonly used for evaluating or measuring the performance of classification models, as I've said, and it measures the percentages of cases that are correctly classified. Now, it's not very easy to evaluate a classifier just based on one performance measure like accuracy. If you remember from linear regression, it was pretty easy. You know, we had the R squared value, we had the P values, you know, we could plot the result and we could see it visually and, and that kind of stuff. So regression models are generally easier to classify or easier to evaluate, but classifiers are a little bit more difficult and therefore we're going to have to define, a, you know, a few more performance measurements and, you know, refer back to them often. So it can be a misleading metric. Accuracy can be a misleading metric and it does not alone tell the full story. So keep that in mind. And this is a good example of why, because, you know, you might be wondering why, right? How can a model have high accuracy, but not be a good classifier? Um, and this is a very good example of that. I love this example. This is an example that I actually took from, you know, back in college when I was actually first learning machine learning. This was the example that the professor gave us. And, and that's when it really, you know, sunk in. And, you know, I've carried this example with me since then. So this one and, and another one I'm going to show you in a little bit to explain the difference, essentially the two different types of classifiers that you might ever want to build and the things to watch out for. So for this one, so imagine you're building a classifier to predict whether a patient has a rare fatal disease like cancer. Okay. So the keyword here is it's rare and it's fatal. Now assume that 0.1% of the population is affected by the disease and you know because it's rare so the if you want to build a classifier let's assume that the positive class you're assigning to patients that have the disease or are found to have cancer and the negative class you're assigning to patients who don't have the disease okay so you want to predict you want a classifier that can correctly identify positive and negative classes within a population and so this is obviously a binary classification problem because you have two classes, you know, it's either positive or negative, you know, there's, they either have cancer or they don't. Now, if the model always predicts that the patient does not have 
the disease. Okay, so it always predicts the negative class. Whatever you throw at it, it always tells you that, you know, my prediction is that, you know, this, you know, is the negative class, right? Regardless of test results, right? it will be right 99.9% .9 of the time. Why? Because only 0.1% of the population actually has cancer. So it'll be wrong only 0.1% of the time because it'll also predict, you know, the 0.1% of the population that, that has cancer. Uh, it will also predict them to be the negative class or patients that don't have the disease, okay? So essentially the classification accuracy would be 99.9%. .9 so even though the accuracy is extremely high, the model is essentially useless, right? Because the critical part, you know, the critical prediction where it's it's important for you to predict accurately is uh, or correctly is the 0.1% of the time, right? You want to identify those who have cancer. That's what's important here in this problem. But you're identifying 100% of these people incorrectly. So model is rubbish, right? You know, there's nothing you can do with it. It has no use whatsoever. So we need other metrics to evaluate the performance of classifiers. Okay. So this example is, you know, is used to emphasize the importance of what I stated in the beginning, where, you know, you have to use these other metrics and accuracy on its own is not enough. Now, I'm going to also be sharing with you another example like this, again, from back when I was learning this in college, which will also show you another problem, another case in which the other performance metric is not enough on its own. Okay. So that's why you have to use a lot of these in conjunction with one another to actually interpret the evaluate the effectiveness of your model correctly. We need to define something called a confusion matrix so that we can actually define those other performance measures or to better understand the definitions of those other performance measures that we're going to be learning about. So um, a confusion matrix is essentially a table where the rows represent actual classes, as you can see here. So these are actual classes. So whether or not the, uh, you know, let's assume, for example, we're talking about the same problem with the cancer, that whether or not the patient actually does have cancer or not. Okay, so that's what the rows represent. And the columns represent the predicted classes. So these are the results or the predictions of our classifier. And each entry is the number of instances with the corresponding actual and predicted classes. So, for example, this cell here, or this entry here, TP, stands for true positive. So this would represent the percentage or the number, I'm sorry, of instances where the patient actually had cancer and the classifier predicted it correctly. So this is very good. This is what we want, right? We want a high number here. We want to hide true positive rate because, you know, this is very good, correct prediction. Now, this would be the false positive number here. So this would mean, or actually, before we go into that, let's just go into to this. as well. So these two are correct classifications, meaning that so this one patient had cancer and it was predicted that he had cancer. So that's good, right? And also here, the patient didn't have cancer and our classifier said, correct uh, or our classifier predicted it correctly as no cancer in that patient so this is a true negative number here or the true negative rate so that means it's true that it's negative like the negative was predicted predicted truly or correctly and the positive was corrected predicted truly or correctly so these two ideally all the numbers here you know everything else should be zero and these should should have all the numbers all the counts because ideally you want a classifier that can correctly predict the yes and the no class correctly, right? But in some problems, it's a little bit more crucial that, you know, this is high and it doesn't matter if this is high or not that much because it's okay if we, you know, if somebody doesn't have cancer and, and your classifier predicts them to have cancer, that's not so bad, right? In some follow-up, you know, checkups and that kind of stuff, they're going to realize that he doesn't have cancer and, you know, there's no harm to anybody except maybe some time lost or some money lost on the checkups, but that's it. But you do not want to falsely classify somebody who does have cancer as not having cancer. So that would be the false negative. So the negative prediction is false, is incorrectly predicted. So 
the patient does have cancer, but it was predicted that he doesn't have cancer, which is very bad. We want this to be zero, ideally. And then here, this it doesn't matter if it's zero or not. I, you know, ideally it would be zero, but it doesn't really hurt anybody if it's not. And that's that, that the patient doesn't have cancer, but our classifier predicts that they do have cancer. So it's uh, very important that you understand this confusion matrix as it's very important in helping you correctly interpret or evaluate the performance of your classifier. It's very, very important. And again, it's going to all depend on the problem you're trying to solve. You know, in the case of the cancer problem, right, you know, you know very clearly that it's crucial that this is zero and that this is high and it's okay if this is not zero or this is not zero, right? So that might change depending on your problem as we're going to see in some of the following slides. So this is a very important and this itself actually is a performance measure. The performance measures we're going to learn in the next slides are going to be like accuracy. It's just going to be like a number that's going to give you information, right? A summary. It's just a single number. But this, you know, is not a single metric, but it's still something that you can use to interpret your or evaluate the performance of your model. So whenever you, you do solve a classification problem or you build a classification model, uh, definitely, you know, print out the confusion me metrics and try to understand what's going on with the classifier and where its strengths and weaknesses lie. So accuracy we defined earlier as the number of correct predictions from all the predictions, right? So essentially what that means is if we use the confusion matrix, it would mean TP plus TN. Why? Because T, you know, we said that accuracy is the number of correct predictions from all the predictions. So the number of correct predictions are TP and TN. Remember, correctly, yes, and it's correctly classified, predicted as yes, no, and it's correctly predicted as no. So TP and TN are the total count or the total correct predictions. So we add them up, TP plus TN, over, we add everything else up together. So all everything, all of this added up together is the total number of predictions because here we are counting our predictions. So, you know, TP plus TN plus FP plus FN is the total number of predictions that we've done or we've conducted. So TP plus TN over FT, FP plus FN plus TP plus TN would correspond to our accuracy metric. And it is essentially answering the question of how often is the classifier correct? That's it. How often is the classifier correct? And it doesn't go into details as to what type of correct it is. Now, for that, we would need precision and recall. So after accuracy, precision and recall are probably the two most important metrics. Or I guess that's open to interpretation, but precision and recall are very important and for classification. So precision corresponds to TP over TP plus FP. Okay, so you have to spend some time thinking about this and why it's different from accuracy. Okay, so in this case, we're answering the question of when predicted positive, right? That's why we're adding TP plus FP, TP plus FP. So when the positive case has been predicted, so when, yes, the patient does have cancer is the result of our classifier, okay? How often is the classifier correct? So that's precision. 